be giving a tutorial today on differentiable analysis, but um, I guess it's a bit of, as Eduardo said, it's a bit of a hot topic, bit of like a bit of an emerging paradigm. Um, so I, I am going to give you some slides first, uh, and then we're going to jump into some code after the fact. I hope that works for you guys. Uh, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. Uh, we'll we'll get started on the conceptual side of uh, of this this talk and tutorial. So uh, I'll be covering two software libraries today, uh, which have like a you know dependency relationship with the arrow to the left. So uh, there's this uh, library called Relaxed, which is basically aiming to provide these these differentiable building blocks that we can use to build you know these full workflows that I'll talk about today. Uh, and then, like, there's the the Neos library and method. It's it's unclear where one starts and the other ends. Um, the Python package exists basically to facilitate the type of workflow that, uh, if you're familiar with it, at least uh, the Neos paradigm talks about. Um, and it's built using Relaxed. So that's the the software we're going to cover today, um, and that's how it's related to each other. Uh, and this is the repository uh, that I will be using today. Um, it's also linked in the Indico, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to follow along, you can do it there. There's also a binder, a binder link if you want to actually execute stuff. Um, but okay, I promised you some conceptual stuff. So let's go there straight away. I'm going to talk to you about how, how do neural networks learn, um, which you may be wondering, why am I telling you about that? Uh, it will be clear very soon. Don't worry. Um, you know, machine learning uh, is in this talk. We have all the buzzwords. So uh, a neural network, as is presented uh, to most people, is this ball and stick diagram, which I've told uh, people many a time I'm not a massive fan of. I think it kind of obscures a bit of the a bit of the details away. But the ball and sticks can basically be thought of as uh, some parameter vector phi, um, which is basically the stuff we want to optimize. You know, it's like the free parameters. That's where like the learning information goes. And then the actual like layout of the ball and sticks is 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 the architecture. And it basically refers to how how am I going to combine those parameters with my data to produce maybe some sensible result. Uh, and then in practice, those the balls uh, basically are a location scale transform of the data with some some weights and biases, which are the parameters uh, like. They are phi together, um, and then we apply some well, uh, activation function, uh, which is just some way to make the line, the location scale transform bendy, because then we can model curves um, instead of just straight lines. And the and, and you know the the gray lines are data in, data out. Uh, so that's a neural network. Uh, and then you might say, okay, well, how does this thing learn? Uh, because it will produce a result. The fact that we have one ball at the end there means we'll get a single number as the output of whatever neural network this is. Uh, I guess there are four inputs. Maybe it's like a four vector or something. Um, so how do we how do we tell the network uh, that, it's, that it's doing well? Well, we need some kind of feedback mechanism from the result uh, to the phi uh, i if we're, if we're doing this in an iterative way. Uh, and that is usually, um, it's usually achieved by the existence of this, this objective function, uh, which is also called the loss because generally it's a, it's a quantity that, is meant to measure how how good we're doing. Uh, you can think about I don't know like first place um, because it's also it's the lowest number but also the best result. Uh, and it, and the reason why lowest is better is because the literature on optimization has tended to gear itself towards minimization as opposed to maximization. I think I think it's an easier problem in some in in, in some way. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is great. So okay, we have an objective now. How do we update the phi i? Um, with some minimization update rule. Well, what I propose to you is this, uh, this famous learning algorithm called gradient descent. And how does gradient descent work? Well, uh, one iteration of gradient descent, at least in its like, you know, non-intelligent, super basic form, um, is, is you take your current phi i, uh, and then you subtract the gradient of, say, this entire construct uh, as a workflow from, you know, from data and parameters to objective. Uh, so data and parameters go in in a scale that comes out. Uh, and we say, okay, we, we subtract the gradient of that whole thing uh, from our phi. And you, you might think, well, I don't really understand that. Why is that a useful construct? Well, if you if you look at this beautifully drawn artistic diagram on the bottom right, where we're, we're a ball rolling downhill in parameter space. So uh, the, the x-axis here would be like the phi i. 
and the uh, the y axes would be the objective, and we want to get to the to the bottom of the curve. But we don't, we, you know, we can't see the whole curve because that would mean we've scanned the whole space. Um, so we want to know how to get to the bottom. And in the absence of gravity, the way we can travel is by, you know, learning where the slope is and moving, you know, kind of against the direction of the slope. Because if the slope's going uphill, we want to go down. Um, and that's why there's a minus sign there, because we're just going in the opposite direction to the gradient. And okay, so that's gradient descent. Um, but one thing I will say is that we we don't actually need neural networks to do this gradient descent method at all. It's just where it's most commonly used. For example, here is the same workflow, uh, but we replaced the neural network with a straight line. I guess technically I said we had a 4D input space, so maybe this is less uh, less descriptive, but uh, maybe it's a 4D plane. Um, and on one side of one region of the plane, we we say, oh, this region is is the signal region. If, if data falls there, we say it's signal. And if things fall on the right-hand side, we say, okay, well, that is uh, that is background. Uh, and then we can use that to compute a result, like uh, it's, it's either one side or the other, or maybe it's some continuous version of that. Um, and then we can we can calculate an objective in the same way because uh, assuming we pr produce a result in the same form, like a single number, um, on the left or on the right, I guess. Uh, and then we could still do this whole thing because the the only real restriction from doing this method was to calculate that gradient, right? And the gradient of the workflow is is a tractable quantity uh, if every step within the workflow is differentiable. Uh, and so the straight parameters of a straight line are, are differentiable. Um, you know. Quite clearly, like if we differentiate with respect to the phi i, which is the m and c, we're going to get like just x, or we're going to get one. So I, I think if we can calculate the gradients by hand, we can maybe trust a computer to do that too. Uh, and yeah, so this is this is entirely possible. And so this is like this is one of the two ideas that I want to uh, present to you today is that using gradient descent, we can optimize any workflow parameters. Don't have to be in your neural network weights. It could be a straight line, for example. Uh, with respect to any goal, if the full workflow is differentiable. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple HEP-like examples of this. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to lay out a pipeline. We'll talk more specifically about the pipeline later, but just to put some things in your brain. Uh, we could imagine maybe if we're doing a, a high energy physics analysis, we start out with some data, including some, you know, uh, signal background contributions and maybe some systematic variations. Um, we might pipe it through a neural network, but uh, what I actually want you to visualize here is just any kind of like abstract set of like analysis configuration steps. This could be like a cut flow or or binning or like, I don't know, maybe you're doing some kind of calibration and within all this, but all, all of that might have free parameters that, that are floating that you might want to optimize with respect to some goal. Uh, a neural network is just an example of that. Um, from there, we're going to produce some kind of one dimensional at least typically, uh, we'll produce a one-dimensional summary statistic of the data, which involves a histogramming step. And then we do kind of like the typical um, things to set limits or get a p-value. We'll construct the likelihood model. We'll, we'll go and Google the asymptotics paper for the millionth time to find out which test statistic we should use. We'll do the hypothesis test uh, and maybe get like, in Atlas, we use this the CLS value, which is just a modified p-value uh, where, you, where you divide by um, a p-value from testing against the background only hypotheses. Uh, and then uh, maybe we want to maybe we want to do something like this where we back propagate through the whole chain. We're going to get to this later, but the, uh, what I would like to just present to you uh, as an idea is that if we wanted to do this uh, to basically get the gradient of that whole workflow, we'd have to get the gradient of every individual step. Um, and you might be asking, well, how, how do we get the gradient of like, I don't know, like likelihood building, right? That's like weird. I can't write that down on a piece of paper. Um, but in practice, this is all code, right? This is all uh, computer code. And there are ways to differentiate computer programs. Uh, and you might have seen some of these names before. Uh, Jax, PyTorch, TensorFlow. These are the machine learning libraries that we all know and love, uh, or at least know. And the... Um, the the real thing that these libraries do is they actually they're frameworks for something called automatic differentiation, and just to give you a, a, a quick explanation of 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 what that means is, uh, if you can imagine like NumPy for example, NumPy is a set of operations that are like you know really frequently used to do linear algebra like you know exponentiation, some I don't know like mesh creation, all sorts of fun stuff, um, but it ultimately, it's just like it, it, it's a set of uh, operations that have 
mostly known gradients, right? Like if you want to take the gradient of like a sum, we know we just take the gradient of all the individual terms. If, if you want to take a gradient of a product, we break it up with the product rule. And then, you know, log X is one over X and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So we know these have derivatives, but how do we actually uh, calculate them, um, especially in an automatic way? Um, and so the bullet isn't actually on the slide, but um, there are systems that you, you can basically make a wrapper around like your numerical programming library. And for every operation, you can just record the derivative uh, that you know already. Uh, and then when you trace, um, sorry, when you, when you run a program, so when you execute it at runtime, you can then just have a look at all the different operations you did, uh, you know, like in a row or in a DAG or whatever. And then you can take all the gradients that you put in and then basically uh, compose them via the chain rule uh, as, as a product. And, and, and then you're done. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying it to some degree, but, you know, there exist efficient ways to do this. Uh, and the, the great thing about automatic differentiation is that it is, it, it's not only efficient, uh, it's exact because we're using these, you know, these analytical uh, primitive derivatives that we uh, uh, we put in ourselves because we we think we're okay at mathematics. So that's just to tell you like where gradients are coming from. Um, but then you might say, okay, well, let's just put all our analysis code in PyTorch and optimize the whole thing, right? Um, well, that doesn't quite work because indeed there are not there are some operations that are not a priori differentiable, right? Like here is a very discrete boy on the right hand side, you know, awfully behaved. When we if we move the like the rug of data beneath a histogram, and we want to know how like the bin heights vary as we do that, um, I mean, well, events are going to stay in the bin they're in as you move the data, um, because remember the gradients are like the language of, of small changes. So I'm thinking if I change X a small amount, how are the bin heights going to change? Uh, and you will think, well, they're either going to, you know, the event will stay in the bin so that it won't move at all, or it will hop over. And then the bins on either side will migrate up and down in this very discontinuous way. So that's not a, a thing we can like get gradients with respect to very easily. Uh, and then this, this is this idea of um, relaxation. Uh, and that's like the, it's 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 a term used in the um, the machine learning literature to mean let's take an operation and approximate it with like maybe a continuous version of that operation such that we can take the gradient across it. Um, and let's let's look a little bit further into this. So here's just a you know an equation showing that like you know not all these things are differentiable and we can change it. So here's an animation of exactly what I just described. Uh, we're shifting the data uh, underneath the histogram and we're seeing how the bin heights are changing. And we can see that basically uh, this isn't well behaved at all. And we might want to change something about that. So something that we did, for example, uh, here, here's like the first relaxation that I'm showing you um, is where we, re we replace the histogramming process with, um, with a kernel density estimate. And a kernel density estimate, for those who haven't heard of it, is basically um, you select a kernel function. Uh, the most common one is, is like the standard normal distribution. Uh, so you have a Gaussian, right? And then so for every data point, you you put a Gaussian on the data point uh, and then you say, okay, well, my probability distribution then is just like the average of all the Gaussians. So you say, I evaluate like at X equals five. I then get the Gaussian at each data point, evaluate that at X equals five. And then I just average the results. And if you do that, you get this pretty like smooth envelope over your data. Um, and what you can do then from, you know, that because this is a smooth envelope, right? How do we get a histogram? What you can do is because, I mean, in this case, we have a, a probability density function that it's just a Gaussian mixture. And that has like a known uh, and tractable cumulative density function. And then you can say, okay, well, the area under the curve in a specific region as defined by a bin is the C, you know, the cumulative density function, you know, up to the right bin edge minus the same thing to the left bin edge. And then you have the area just in that region. And so that's how we construct these, these differentiable histograms. Um, and that, that'll be one of the first things we'll go into. Um, there's some other stuff, uh, that we'll get, we'll talk about later, um, including cuts, uh, differentiable likelihood building and also differentiable fitting. Uh, so that's the first part of the, the conceptual presentation. I'm now going to show you some degree of that in code. And so I'll be again, using this, uh, differentiable analysis examples repository that I've created. Um, and if you click the, there's a binder link there, and if you click that, um, if you want to run it, you can just watch me. Um, you will get a server connection error. No, no, you will get you will get some instance, and you'll you'll be able to see all the notebooks. 
uh some of the stuff uh like some of the animations might not work um but i'll be showing you them anyway so uh and if you really want to make it yourself you can you can ask me after the fact um i will quickly pause here though just in case there are any questions i do have the slido open in front of me and i don't see anything but someone can correct me if i have the wrong version open no questions so far okay fantastic uh so let's let's get jump uh let's jump into the, into the code then um so I was telling you about differentiable histograms. Uh, so let's look at that first. So uh, a differentiable histogram, we define it via a kernel density estimate. I have like a link there, which, you know, talks more detail uh, in more detail about the implementation. You know, it's basically the same thing I just talked about. Um, but, you know, through these notebooks, I'm basically going to be um, showing you the images mainly. Uh, and I'll highlight the parts of the code that are doing the magic. So the text is mainly for you to go back and look at later. Um, so let's have a look. Um, okay, yeah. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run the first two cells of this notebook uh, to get this beautiful thing, because I want to show you, uh, well, I need to get my matplotlib settings to work. There you go, a little bit bigger now. Okay. Um, so here is a example of a histogram of some data compared to um we call this uh the kde histogram we call it a bkde b standing for bind um and there's this base there's this parameter i didn't tell you about actually so uh remember how i said uh we put a gaussian at every data point so i've specified uh the center of that gaussian but i didn't specify to you the width of the gaussian uh and that's because all the widths are controlled at the same time with this uh this this global parameter you can set it's called the bandwidth uh, and we're going to see what happens to both the kernel density estimate and the histogram as we vary the bandwidth. So the first thing you'll notice actually is that the curves are a little bit off. You know, the histogram doesn't match the actual histogram. So aren't, aren't we doing a bad job? Uh, and I say, okay, well, I'm going to reduce the bandwidth a bit. And we see what happens. Okay, we're doing a lot better now. And, it, and it, maybe it looks like it's actually going to converge. So I'm going to drag it all the way to the left. And whoa, whoa, what's going on there? Everything got a bit crazy. Um, now, if you look closely, you'll see that the dotted orange line, or, or I guess it's not the dotted line, the, it's the solid line. It is actually tracing over the histogram perfectly. If I take it slightly less uh, bandwidth or more bandwidth, you'll see that that's true. Uh, but why is it so like, why is the kernel density estimate so like jagged? Um, well, that's because if we have a Gaussian at every data point and we shrink the width to zero, then we have a bunch of like, basically delta functions uh, at every point. And if we integrate over those, we're going to be counting events, you know, uh, because, you know, it's just a contribution of one for every every event. So while the envelope of the function looks horrible, we do recover a standard histogram. Um, now, you might be asking, well, I mean, if we want a standard histogram, we can use a histogram, right? Well, what's this for? Well, uh, as I said, the thing we want is we want we want the gradient of, of the uh, of the heights of these bins. Uh, and I'll give you an example below where we can use that. Uh, you know what, let's just do that right now. So we're going to optimize through a histogram and through just means that, you know, we're, we're taking the gradient of like a quantity involving like the histogram yield. Um, and, you know, so gradients uh, start before it, you know, with some quantity like the data, which we move, and then the bin height will move. And then the gradient goes across that process. Um, and so this is a bit of a confounded um, optimization problem just for demonstration purposes. So um, we're saying if we have many events xi, what is the value delta such that the peak of the histogram of xi plus delta, so we're making a histogram of, of xi and then we're shifting all of the data by some constant factor. And we're saying what happens when the peak of that histogram is that some desired target value you know it's completely you know uh, a toy problem um but the reason why we might need this uh differentiable histogram is because well if we set this up with gradient descent like i talked about to optimize this delta term um we're gonna have this we're gonna have this uh mean squared error uh, which i'm highlighting there in blue so the, it's the the mean of the histogram just like i talked about um after we've shifted the data and then we say minus the target value. So if you want our data to, you know, our histogram to have a mean of three, we say, okay, T equals three in the last term. And then we will 
take the gradient of this loss, uh, which we you know is obviously going to be zero when the mean equals t, uh, and then we you know we try and minimize it. Uh, and so that's what I do. If you run these cells, uh, we, we get to do some gradient descent fun. You'll see the value of delta moving. And I guess there's a, a video here that I cannot hide. Um, and we see what happens when when this system learns. So the 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 maroon line you can see moving from left to right. That's the the current mean of the histogram. And the histogram itself is moving left to right as we shift the delta. And we wouldn't have been able to do this if we didn't have differentiable histograms. I'm actually curious. So I'm going to um I'm going to go into the code and I'm going to change. So I, I told you I'd highlight the interesting parts of the code. Right here is like the shift histogram function, uh, which is, you know, uh, where we shift the inputs and make a histogram of them. And you notice here we're using the first version of, of, of relaxed. So instead of like numpy.histogram, I'm using relaxed.hist. And I'm also providing, I'm providing my inputs. I'm providing my bins in the numpy style. And then I'm also providing this bandwidth term. Um, which is a, a controlling that you know degree of approximation. Um, so if I if I comment this out, and I just and I write soft counts equals um, let's do numpy dot histogram of uh, what was it shifted shifted inputs and then bins bins equals bins. Um, I guess what I should actually do is make sure we're using Jack's version of NumPy, which I think we are, or maybe we're not. It doesn't matter. Um, and then what happens if I try and execute the same thing? Uh, it's going to start failing and complaining. Um, yeah, OK. So the, it's complaining because we used regular NumPy, and we need everything to be in our you know, automatic differenti uh, differentiation framework. So what I will just do to get around that is I will say um, import jacks.numpy as as uh, as np, and then we'll do exactly the same thing again. And we have we have an error again. Um, it's not the error I wanted to show you. Um, the error that we should have gotten is like the gradients is zero. I think there's maybe some other stuff in here that doesn't work. But anyway, I didn't I didn't test this beforehand. Um, but the point is that it's not going to work <laughs> um, through whatever mechanism you decide to show. Uh, so the last, okay. The last thing I'm going to try is just, just doing this term. So everything else should be normal NumPy. No, it still doesn't work. Okay, great. It doesn't work, but that's what I wanted to show you is that we, we need uh, differentiable histograms, um, in order to be able to do this optimization problem. Um, and if, if histograms wasn't your, you know, didn't take your fancy, I'm going to show you basically the same principle again. Uh, but through a much more familiar like analysis uh, challenge instead of some abstract problem. Uh, and we're going to be optimizing a cut value to get the best significance. Um, and so the the first thing we do here is just just some data generation. It's all toy, not necessarily important. Here's the resulting plot. Um, so we have some exponentially falling background with a signal sitting on top of it. Um, and we might say, oh, let's make a cut on this on this value x uh, and see if we can get better significance. Um, and I, I should have a Jupyter widget open. Um, I got to run the cells in order. That would drastically help my situation. Uh, I think that did the trick. There we go. OK, so once again, you guys hate this as well. When you update matplotlib settings in line in a Jupyter notebook, I have to run the cell twice. I should just use like a matplotlib RC file. Anyway. So here is an example of varying the cut value and seeing the significance we get with a particular cut. So if I put my cut all the way to the right, uh, we have a significance of 0 0.03. I don't think Atlas will publish that. So I'm going to say, right, let me just, let me dial it back a bit, see how much of the orange I can keep. So if I do like that, I'm keeping most of the orange. That's, oh, well, 4.8 sigma. We're nearly there. We're nearly there to the grant application. I'll, uh, I'll squeeze it to the right. I, I think that's about the best we can do. Five sigma, I'll take it. Um, and I'm sitting here enjoying my new tenure track position. So fantastic. So that's, you know, typical. That's what we'd like to do um, in, an, in an analysis, you know, just do it by hand. But maybe there's maybe there's a more intelligent way to do this. Um, let's have a look. Oh, I do see a quick question that I'll quickly answer. Uh, so about um, it's about the automatic differentiation frameworks that I showed. Because uh, I talked a little bit about Jacks in the previous uh, notebook, 
Uh, and the question says, out of TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX, which, which is the go-to for automatic differentiation in terms of performance, the short answer is whatever works with your current setup. And the long answer is um, for GPUs, uh, basically uh, JAX and PyTorch are the way to go. If you want to do standard machine learning stuff, PyTorch is way more mature in terms of an ecosystem. If you want to do like researchy type stuff, like I'm showing you here, then JAX is a little bit more flexible for that. Uh, so yeah, that's the answer to that. Um, let's go on with the cut example. So, um, you know, as I just showed you, um, we can get the significance uh, like optimized pretty well by just scanning over the values uh, of, of the cut and seeing what happens. We do the same thing here. Uh, so here's a plot of the significance as we vary the cut value and the optimal cut. I think that's about what we had before. Yeah. So we, we came up with a cut of 1.5. The optimal cut is 1.54. Uh, and then you get the best significance there. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you um, a relaxed version of a cut. Uh, and we're going to do gradient descent to optimize it uh, automatically, because maybe in a real analysis, you'll have many cuts and you can't, you can't do this fun scrolly thing for every single one of them. Um, so a sigmoid function um, has the form here, if you can see it on the right. So it, it's one over one plus uh, e, e to the minus X. Uh, and I'll show you basically what that looks like below um, after I run the cell. Um, cut values is not defined. Why are we trying to do that? Nathan, just to say you've got a couple of minutes more or less, okay? A couple of minutes? Yeah. Flies. Well, a few, well, a few, a few it, more, it, but not, not 10. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I thought it was a 45 minute slot, but okay. Uh, we're, we're pretty much, um, we're pretty much so, towards the end anyway. Um, so, so, sorry, I mean, sorry, my, my, my fault. Indeed, yeah, you, you, have, you have the full hour. So it's, it's a one hour slot, right? I was like, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have so like three more sorry. notebooks to go through. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'm just sorry. Okay, okay. Oh, you scared me there for a second. All right. Um, okay, now I can, now I feel like I have enough time to run my, uh, run my cells <laughs> after that, uh, after that brief scare. Uh, there we go. Okay, beautiful. This is exactly what I wanted to show you. So, um, I I'll draw your eyes to the plot on the left here. Uh, where we have um, a plot of the weight applied at X from both a hard cut and a sigmoid cut. So what I mean by a hard cut is that we're just saying, keep all the values bigger than the cut value. So this is a cut at two. And I'm saying, okay, that's equivalent to applying a weight of zero um, at every value less than two and a weight of one at every value bigger than two. Um, and you can imagine then that there's a pretty easy way to think about this in a continuous way. Well, you say, okay, if I bend this slope a bit, like this orange line, uh, and that's it, that's the formula I showed you above. We're plotting a uh, one over one plus e to the minus x uh, with a slope parameter um, multiplying the x. Uh, and I can show you what happens actually as we vary that slope. Um, so you can see as we go from left to right, the slope changes, and then you have a plot on the right of how the, the data itself changes. So if we go all the way to the left, um, or sorry, the right, where we have like a maximum slope, you can see that the data after the cut from the hard cut and the soft cut is the same. Um, and if we, if we reduce the slope a little bit, uh, basically making it more smooth, which in your mind you can think about as uh, less variance in the gradients, because if you have a really steep function, you're going to get like a lot of variance uh, as you try and take the gradient across the cut value. Um, and you can see we're introducing a bit more of an approximation, right? So we're actually getting some leakage to the left of the cut. And that is just an artifact of the, uh, of, of the fact that we're, we're changing the slope to, to be non-zero uh, on the left-hand side of the, of the cut value. Um, but what that will do, though, is give us a much smoother gradient um, estimate. And then we'll be able to We'll be able to use it in optimization. And I'll show you in the in the next plot, actually, that it might not matter so much that we're introducing a bit of approximation, because in the real analysis, we can take the cut values we, we get from the optimization and then use them as the you know cut value for the hard versions of all the operations. Uh, but I'll show you that here below. So here's, here's the scan of the significance with the, um, with the hard cut there in blue. And then the soft cut there in orange. And you can see, okay, well, clearly there's some approximation going on, right? Um, but actually, if you look at the location of the maxima, we're basically in the same place. You know, it's about 1.5. Uh, 
And that's the only important part when we're doing this, we we're introducing this notion of approximation, because of course we'd like the, you know, like the slope of the sigmoid to be as close to, to you know, maximum as possible. Um, at some point we won't be able to train though when we do that. Um, but, you know, the really important thing is that if we just find the place where we have the best significance, that will hopefully be, a, you know, approximately true for both the soft and the hard operations. And, and I don't know if I'm, I might have actually missed the step when I meant to define this, but, you know, by hard and soft operations, I mean, the, the original operation, like the, the cut with no relaxation and the soft cut is what is the sigmoid I'm talking about. So it's, it's, you know, it's been made relaxed in some way. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as I show you the next step. And, and I, I will just quickly flash the API of what I just showed. So in this function here, um, you can see that there's this relax.cut um, function being called, and it's being called on the data with a cut value and then, the, and then also a slope value. So you'll notice there's a pattern here that everything we're calling is exactly the same as maybe like we'd expect from NumPy or, or whatever, but we're just adding an extra parameter that's you know controlling the amount of approximation that we have. So from an API perspective, I think it's pretty nice. Um, now, what happens if we do this whole thing with gradient descent? So I'm going to say, uh, like I've been talking about, right? If we want to do this optimization, um, this optimization, we need to have a metric to minimize. Uh, and so instead of having like, I have like a helper function here to calculate the Asimov significance. Uh, and instead of optimizing that, I will just optimize one over that and that will minimize that, therefore maximizing the significance. I've just seen a, an extra question. Uh, so how are the entries selected with the sigmoid? Are they weighted? So indeed, it's exactly what I, what I just showed. Um, great thing to point out though, because um, like I said, so... I guess the the thing that's different is that when you apply a hard cut, you're actually going to do like, um, I mean, in code, you're going to write something like, uh, you know, X indexed at X bigger than the cut value, right? So you're actually going to just lose all the entries that you didn't care about. Um, but the difference here, I guess, is that you you just have a set of weights instead. So it's exactly this. It's It's weighted um by like one at this data far from the cut and then you know near the cut is where we start to you know reduce the those weights and then at the end of it we're, we're at zero again um but yeah so we, we have to like save these weights basically um and we should be able to drop the ones that are like identically zero without like suffering in this you know uh gradient um gradient paradigm but uh yeah that that's that's how it works you're exactly right um so yeah the the thing about the this is also a great question. Uh, how can you be sure that location of, of the maxima is the same? Um, you don't know. Um, but that's why you do these scans, uh, which you can't always do. Um, I guess like this one. But you can say, like, I mean, a histogram has no approximation at bandwidth equals zero. And it was very clear that as we, um, as we you know, drag that bandwidth from left to right, that we introduced some approximation that was very clear, like how much, uh, and maybe you have some really unstable situation where that's, that suddenly creates this massive discrepancy between like the position of the true maxima and the approximated maxima. But I think that because these notions are tunable, you can at least say it's probably good enough uh, to some degree. And then, I mean, there's no guarantee though. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. But I would say it's at least something you can diagnose because you can tune the amount of approximation. And then you can, you know, you can always run it with everything set to no approximation. And then you can see if the maxima is, um, it, or, or like at least your result is, is pretty good. But yeah, you can't know for sure the location of the true maxima in practice. And I think that's like something you kind of have to live with. Um, and then I'll just do one more question before I keep going on. Um, so is it possible to make the smooth cut increasingly harder through our optimization or are there are issues? Now that's a fantastic question because that's something that I've, I've, I've wanted to try for a bit and I think that it would work. So this is, this is something that, um, I mean, I, so just to explain the idea is that um, you can imagine that as we get closer to like a minimum in like your lost landscape, maybe then you can have some additional approximation because like the steps you were going to be taking are not going to be as big. So maybe if we make things a little less approximate and we make this a little bit more like a bit of a crazier loss landscape, 
Uh, because we're only moving in small jumps, maybe we can actually move in a little small jump to somewhere you know that we actually want to be. Um, so it's a great idea, and I I, I haven't tested this properly yet, uh, and I don't think there would be issues in practice beyond like trying to make sure that you you know the the issues you could arise with are like suddenly your gradients do go crazy and your whole training crashes, uh, and so that would be something you'd have to monitor. But uh, it's a great question, great idea. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to go a little further and then we can come back to some more questions. Um, so um, let's see. The I, I left you here where we, we, we compared the significance um, of the soft and the hard cut. Uh, and I, I, I said that, you, can, you know, you can see the cut value position is is pretty, uh, pretty similar. Uh, and, and this is all the code you need to like actually optimize the system, right? So like I said, we're optimizing one over the Asimov significance. Um, and we have this really neat, um, like minimization, um, API from, uh, Jax opt, which is a optimization library written in, in Jax. Um, we need to keep everything in Jax to make sure the gradient information is propagated. That's why I'm doing that. Um, but they also have like SciPy solvers and stuff as well. So it's, uh, you can, you can use something you're more familiar with, but here we're just using gradient descent. Um, and you know, this, this, this cell, if I hit enter, like it runs, uh, or oh, I haven't, I need to run the whole notebook. So I'm just going to spam shift enter to make sure we have like some idea of coherence. Um, okay, great. So that cell runs in about, it's like half a second, you know, uh, and we already find like a cut value of 1.35. Um, and you can see the significance of that cut uh, is 5.17. And the best significance we could have ever got is 5.19. And I'd say that's pretty good. Um, and the significance there is calculated with no approximations. Just like I said, we're taking that value and using it in the hard version of this calculation. Um, and yeah, I guess a quick a quick nod to to Alex Alb, who's definitely among us somewhere, uh, because this you know this 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 at least explanation is based on a notebook you made. So thank you for that. Um, okay, I'll just quickly check the um, questions one more time. Okay, so I only missed one actually. Um, just asking, isn't sigmoid usually used for classification algorithms? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, a sigmoid, uh, a sigmoid output is, is used in neural networks where you want to have, you know, a bunch of different, uh, output nodes, and then you use the sigmoid to basically, you know, fill those with different, like, uh, probabilities. Um, but you know, here's just showing you another example where it can be used to approximate the step function. Um, you know, there's no. There's no real restriction to, to the way in which you use these things. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's the answer is correct, and, and it, it is both. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll show you while we're in this paradigm, I hope you're getting like the message that we can do like using these um, differentiable versions of operations, we can use gradient descent to solve some you know typical problems we have in high energy physics. Uh, I'm going to run all the cells because I don't want to have any more errors and slow us down any further. So. We're in the um, we're in the same paradigm. We have a uh, uh, you know signal uh, back on top of some background, and and what we're doing here instead is uh, I'm going to propose a different analysis problem and say, okay, I've shown you some bidding, but say we don't know what the ideal bidding is to get the best significance. Um, and this is again something we can optimize um, if we have a differentiable histogram uh, because we can you know. As the bin edges move, um, things will migrate again in a normal histogram. But in a in a BKDE, in this you know relaxed histogram, the the bin heights will vary smoothly. And why do we care? Well, the bin heights, as I said before, um, they are used to calculate the significance, right? Because you need the number of events in the bin from signal and the number of events from background. So if we if those are not smoothly defined, then we can't calculate the gradient. So uh, I'm going to be showing you an example of differentiable binning optimization using a differentiable histogram. Um, histogram, sorry. Uh, so just I'm just going to scroll through and see if there's anything new. I think um, it's the same sort of thing. So I, I'm, you know, here's the pipeline to calculate the significance, um, where basically there's just there's a couple of lines here that make sure like the bins don't overlap. Um, but then you know this loss is it's exactly the same as before. You know, we 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 make a histogram of the signal um, with the new bins and the histogram of the background with the new bins uh, with some bandwidth that we decide to pick, 
Um, and then we optimize again, one over the Asimov significance. You know, it, it could have been minus the Asimov significance or whatever, as long as down means better. Um, and I think if, let's see, so the, yep. Oh, and here's some results. Okay. So, oh, sorry, the legends are kind of a bit intrusive. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the legend and you're going to trust me that orange is signal and blue is background. Okay. That's a trust thing we're going to have together. Uh, there we go. Okay. Fantastic. So here are some example, um, binnings of, 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 of the data I showed you before, um, where we have, um, in, in the title of each plot, we have the number of bins, uh, that we need to keep fixed because, you know, we, we can't have 2.5 bins. If we could, then maybe we could do this kind of smooth optimization. Um, but I haven't thought of a good way to do that yet. So, uh, and I, I think it's pretty cool. It's like, um, you know, the shapes are pretty funky, but uh, from a stat only significance perspective, uh, these are actually looking not so bad for histograms. Um, and, and one thing that I really like, actually, it's a little bit subtle, but you can see that the axis, you know, the, the axes aren't actually starting at zero. They're starting at like one. And that's because the bin edge on the far left is actually being dragged to the right. So it's actually learning to make a cut um, because there's only really, if we go back to like the first plot, there's only really background, uh, you know, less than one. Um, and there's only, there's actually a bit of leakage past zero. That's just because I generated with a normal distribution. It's not physical. Don't worry about it. But uh, all of the binnings learn to like cut away that, that bit of background that wasn't really doing anything. Uh, so I think that's, that's a pretty uh, cute application. And, you know, we're, we're discovering all of these signal processes, which is great. Um, um, and okay. Uh, I think I have the same thing, but animated. Yeah, here we go. So we can see what happens to the binning like during the optimization. Um, and then I guess uh, I guess here you can see that cut happening actually. Yeah, there you go. Um, so the bins are shrinking. It's a little bit slow, uh, but yeah, we'll get there. So it's, it's saying, okay, I'm gonna really shrink this because I'm not losing any signal and I get to keep all the, um, you know, keep removing the background in that bin. Uh, and yeah, like the signal to background ratio is, is going up pretty much all the time that it's doing this weird thing right now where it goes down for a bit, but then it recovers and says, okay, let's, let's increase the significance again. But, um, yeah, just to show you that this is possible. And if we look at the code for this, um, again, we're just using this, um, this, uh, the loss function, the one over the significance, the optac solver from Jaxopt, um, and then there's just a bit of boilerplate here to like do some plotting but you know it, i think it's uh reasonably clear like you know we're, we're doing a number of steps and we're doing for i and range steps uh and then we're just updating the solver um i think i saw a, a question here let's see um okay here we go so why use one over the significance why then my then minus significance uh, no reason. I think minus log significance is probably the best thing to use, right? Uh, but I mean, this is a pretty toy problem. I mean, it's not gonna, we can actually, you know what, let's, let's just change it. Let's just do it right now. Now it's minus significance and I'll let that run for a bit. Um, and we can come back to it, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's no reason at all. Um, in practice, uh, okay. So what happens this time? Minus significance. Uh, we can skip ahead. Yeah, it's about the same. Oh, it's it really full screens. That's quite fun. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's it seems to be uh, doing pretty much the same thing. But yeah, no no real reason for it. I don't know which one has more numerical stability. Um, another great question uh, is relaxed uh, and what I'm showing working well together, like hist and boost histogram, or the bridges needed. Bridges are needed um, because a relaxed histogram is a fundamentally different object from like a hist histogram and they only really have utility in optimization. This is something we, we haven't really discussed like so much um, from an API perspective. And it, you know, it would involve like hooking in jacks on some level to making sure the derivatives pass through. But uh, yeah, in, in practice, that would be great. Right. So you could, then you could use a, like this exactly the same API, like through all these great hip, um, hip packages we have. Um, and you wouldn't have to like, you know, jump uh, through these like, you know, NumPy histogram hoops. We could just use the nice hist objects. Um, but yeah, there's no conversation there, but that's one I'd happily start. I just have no idea how to do it. 
Um, there was one last question that I'll answer before I move on to the final notebook. Um, let's see. The max discrepancy can be quantified by checking the optimal hard cut, but what if that's computation expensive? Exactly. So yeah, I mean, that's what I went on to say. I, I said that you can check the optimal hard cut, but in reality, we can't do this. Um, but like to have something that has a tunable degree of approximation that you can, you know, try your best to make as much like the original as possible, and then have something that you know is intelligently optimizing towards a minimum of that function. That's as good as you can do, in my opinion. Um, and there are no, there are no strict guarantees. There are no theoretical guarantees, but you can definitely say that, well, the, the less approximation I'm using, the closer to that position I will be. Um, and, and yeah, like exactly. It's computationally expensive. So you can't know, but like what method can know is my other question. Cause I'd rather use that if you know of that one. Um, but okay. So that's, that's, um, that's differentiable binary optimization. Um, I will quickly jump back to slides, um, just to show you one last thing. Um, because what I've just shown you there was, um, was all to do with, uh, optimizing existing problems we have in HEP um, with gradient descent. But now I want to give you a second thing, which is what if we can use this to get better objective functions? So for example, uh, what makes a good observable, right? I was talking a lot about one over the significance, minus significance, whatever, but that's, you know, that's this Asimov significance formula that doesn't account for background. And maybe the shape of our machine learning observable isn't actually that good when we include our systematic variations because the observable, like the training process has no idea about like the profiling stages we're doing when we build the likelihood function. Um, and, you know, here's just a quote from a deep learning uh, review that says we need to account for systematic uncertainties. Um, so that's the, that's the next idea. Can we learn to incorporate systematics? Uh, and this is idea two from the previous, uh, you know, workflow that I showed about optimizing a machine learning workflow is that we can directly optimize the discovery significance or, or the CLS if you're an Atlas person. Uh, well, they're not the same, but um, you know, if we, can, if we could do this, right? This is a systematic aware con you know, construct because we, we, are, that we are putting our systematics into the likelihood function. And then we are profiling over them when we make the profile likelihood ratio. And if we minimize the p-value of this whole thing, it no, you know, and this p value, this is the thing we're reporting, right? To get our grant applications, we say it's this many sigma plus or minus whatever. Um, and if we can optimize that thing, that is, you know, that's what we really want to do. Um, and how do we do that? Well, uh, we can use a, a, a lot of the stuff we, uh, you know, that I've just shown. Um, so if I go back a couple of slides, this this thing, right? So this this is exactly what I proposed to you. You know, this is saying, okay, let's do a, a hypothesis test and let's optimize the result from that directly. Um, and so you can see to do this, we're going to need a differentiable bin summary statistic, a differentiable likelihood model, and a differentiable test statistic and hypothesis test. Now, the first one we covered already, right? We have differentiable histograms already. Um, differentiable likelihood modeling, um, what we can do for that is we can use uh, PyHF, which is this wonderful Python package that implements like the hist factory likelihood. Uh, and then for the test statistic, it's actually already differentiable to do like this maximum likelihood fitting, but we are using a little trick underneath the hood. I don't think I have time today to talk about that, but if you ask it as a question, I can, I can, you know, add that explanation. Uh, and so that's what we have in the last notebook. Um, so we're going to optimize a simple one bit analysis um, that has a systematic, and we're going to show that we find the systematic aware solution and not the statistical only solution. Um, so this is the model we're looking at here. Um, so we're saying it's one bin where the signal contribution is a fixed number plus phi, some parameter phi. Uh, the background is again fixed, uh, but it's minus two phi. So as we decrease phi, we get more background, uh, less background uh, and more signal. But then we have a background uncertainty term that depends on phi squared. And just to show you what that looks like, we have another fun widget plot. So as we drag phi from left to right, the background goes down. The signal goes up, but uh oh, what's this? We have this gray band of uncertainty that's going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Uh, and this is like a pathologically constructed example to give us um, a case where we have like, you know, 
signal to background ratio is optimal on the right hand side and but we we've have background uncertainty that you know we know means we're going to do less well than we think we are uh you know this isn't you know this isn't just a question of amount of blue versus amount of orange this is you know there's some kind of complicated question that we're really want to, wanting to ask which is actually maybe one of, we want to do something like this right where we still have a good ratio but we have a small background uncertainty as well um so here's um here is basically in code um me calculating a p value from this entire thing because i said we want to make it differentiable right so we have a histogram so uh we don't need to make that differentiable we can just grab the yield straight away uh which we're doing there uh we make a model with a differentiable version of pi hf um we calculate our asimov data for that model um and we you know this model it, it's called uh, uncorrelated background it means we have one bin wise uncorrelated uh, systematic i mean there's only one bin so uncorrelated doesn't matter but uh it's just like a fixed uncertainty the you know with these um with the background uncertainty there we're, we're basically you know interpolating between the up and the down uh, and calling that like that's our continuous description of the uncertainty um and yeah so well, then we then we actually calculate the discovery p value and so what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of this entire pipeline um and that will hopefully give us a systematic aware result um so if we scroll down a little bit to this plot this is basically scanning over the p values with and without the uncertainty component on the model so if you take the gray band away you get this um the p value corresponding to the purple curve and you can see that the best p value when we have no uncertainty is to shove phi all the way to the right remember where we have no uncertainty we have sorry we have high uncertainty but we have be the best signal to background ratio when in you know in actuality our best results it's somewhere like around phi equals five and we can like we can play with this right so we're kind of around phi equals five here and we have like a a nice balance of uncertainty and signal to background ratio and that's what we're actually looking for uh and so the question is if we run this optimization process will we will we be able to find the correct minimum and uh it takes about two seconds to run uh and we get a phi that's almost exactly the optimum solution uh it's exactly the same optimization api as we showed before um, and if you run this this more complicated thing that all it is is plotting code, uh, we get this fun animation which I'll play from the start. So, the the blue point is where we're currently at in the optimization, and you can see that the blue point, uh, which is the value of phi that we're optimizing, um, it's it's going to the you know it's following exactly this blue curve that was you know it's the full model p, the discovery p value that we were able to optimize with respect to. And I think this is super cool because you can see that you can see the network learns to stop where it decides, okay, that that's enough, you know, uncertainty reduction. Now I start to care more about the signal to background ratio. Um, and if we, if we did the same thing with Asimov significance, we'd end up all the way to the right, you know, and we'd have a awful background uncertainty. Um, and I think based on time, I do have one last notebook that I, I will just flash. If you want to do the more complicated thing that I've shown in my paper and my other presentations, um, you know, this Neos workflow, I have this, you know, big notebook there that like introduces this, uh, this toy problem. And, um, you know, it, it does like the actual full optimization uh, and shows you that we can reproduce the paper plots. And I guess the only thing that I will say about this is that there's some, you know, based on what I've shown you, I think there's a speculation that you can just like use Neos as like a drop in loss function. When in, when in actuality, um, you need to have a detailed statistical model specification, because if you want to optimize your specific systematics to your analysis, you need to be able to describe those. Uh, and if you aren't able to, like, if you don't have like a PyHF or, or like, I mean, if you don't have some likelihood function, it doesn't have to be anything to do with uh, hist factory um, that involves this, you know, process that you can't just drop in like some Neos code. Uh, and suddenly your systematics are being picked up on. It, it does require some more detailed physicist input in that respect. Um, so I think that's me done. Um, and I will now just scroll through and see if there are any questions that came up during that. Um, is there a risk of bias when optimizing significance in this way? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about what I just showed um, based on the time that was asked. Um, so if we optimize significance this way, um, 
there is a bias in the, you know, where there is approximation. So there's absolutely a bias involved when doing this um, process with uh, where we're using these differentiable surrogates. Um, but actually, in this particular example, if we use so if we use the differentiable histogram and the bandwidth was not identically zero, we have a bias, right? Uh, I mean, you can see if we if we even go back to that first uh, notebook, like we're literally making a bias, right? Like the yields are not Poisson distributed. There is a bias that we're in, we are introducing in the optimization. Um, but the the actual the result um, that is calculated with no approximation, so your actual analysis that will not be biased, but your optimization will be um, because you're not actually optimizing the the like the true, true, true significance. And, and, and then if you were, then you wouldn't actually be biasing in that way. I guess it's as biased as, you know, like your learning algorithm is biased. Um, let's see, did I miss anything else? I think that, I think that uh, does it for questions on Slido. So I can say, thank you very much for listening. And then I will open up to any auditory questions if there are any. Thanks so much, Nathan. I'm sorry for the hiccup. <laughs> no, no, it's no problem at all. It actually took us the time with a bit of a bit of hiccup. No, so, but that was brilliant, by the way. That ex excellent uh, pre presentation. I really enjoyed it and personally, and uh, I really had a few a few thoughts myself for, for some applications. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, we can talk I'm about. I'm pretty it. sure the same the same for, for for many other people. So yeah, I don't know if there's any more questions or even live. Uh, yeah, you did. You go through everything on Slido, actually, and we still have two minutes. But raise yeah, your hand. I, mean, I can hover you? for two minutes. Yeah, no. <laughs> burning questions. Yeah. I mean, you can talk about your application if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, actually, it might be touched by the next presentation. So I was okay. thinking about optimizations for uh, in complicated up to analysis, where sometimes mm. the the binning in in the uh, phase space of the decays matters, and uh, so. People do this sometimes a bit uh, semi ad hoc way, and this sounds like something that could that could be a that could be an application. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, what's actually quite quite funny is that if you scroll down in the binning notebook, I actually have all this code that that tries to do like systematic aware binning, which mm -hmm. is uh, binning optimization. Um, there are some hiccups because we haven't gotten the specific model here fully differentiable yet because you know like the, when you form a systematic it needs to be differentiable um and i think for this model um this kind of uncorrelated systematic is you know i have a pr into PyHF, um but it, you know we excuse me we haven't um fully worked out the details so um this didn't necessarily pan out super well but um it's it's like i could run the optimization and i think that's also very interesting that we could we could do this kind of like you know cutting cutting and binning optimization all at once. Um, and actually, one thing I will just quickly say, since I have it at like 30 extra seconds, is that this Neos notebook, um, if you scroll down to the, uh, you know, like the printout of the optimization, you can see that what it, it's also printing the bin edges. Uh, and actually, the binning of the model is being optimized at the same time as the neural network. So these are these they, these are being optimized at the same time, and so you could even have this with cuts as well, right? You could have a a cut and, and a binning and and the neural network, and and it's all optimized at you know at the same time, and it's all talking to each other. So you don't have like one thing that worked well, but oh, if we change the cut now, the histogram is bad. Um, and I think this that's actually one of the biggest uh, areas of promise. I think is this joint end to end optimization of of an entire workflow. But uh, yeah, yeah, just wanted to flash that. Yeah, that, that sounds indeed very very interesting, very interesting. So th th thank you.